Awesome. Well, thanks everybody for being here. I am going to introduce Katie. Most of you uh, know her already as the um, team leader up there in Sunset Corridor. Uh, Katie served in the real estate industry since 2009. Um, started a real estate career working on a team during the height of the foreclosure market where they uh, processed hundreds of REO properties. Since then, Katie has focused on customer service, leadership, and business development through her various market center roles. Uh, Katie has worked in real estate on the national level where she served as a director at Keller Williams Realty International in Austin, Texas, and most recently as the team leader at Keller Williams Sunset Corridor and COO of the Experience Brokerage Network. Her passion is people, which is why she's excited to be teaching this session, Connect With Your Market. And I will go ahead and turn things over to Katie. Thank you, Erin. Um, I'm so excited, you guys, that I get to spend time with you. This is the largest Zoom Ignite class that I have been a part of. So you guys are lucky. Like sometimes when we do these rounds, there's like one or two people. So the fact that you get to collaborate on such a high level is so, so fun. So thank you for allowing me. Thank you for showing up today, first of all, um, on a Monday after a sunny weekend and Mother's Day. I appreciate that. And I know that Mondays are hard. So I appreciate you being here and also allowing me to be part of this conversation. Um, I'm going to hopefully share my screen. Here we go. Mm, that's not what I wanted. Um, let me pull up the slides. And then we will get started. Uh, like Aaron said, I have been in the real estate industry since 2009, which um, means I've seen a lot of different markets, but I've also been in different cities. So I started in California, then I was in Texas, now I'm in Oregon. So I tell you that just to say, I understand the importance of connecting with your market at a deep level. And each market is a little bit different. So we are going to go over, oh, here, I'm going to try and keep my slides going with the presentation. Um, we are on module three of real estate expert of choice. So this whole pillar is about being an expert and understanding what it means to be a real estate agent and, and the information that, and the knowledge that goes along with that. So today we're covering connect with your market. We'll go over different factors to research and consider to be prepared before meeting with clients. This is a path to becoming the real estate expert of choice. So um, today's agenda, we'll talk about know your market, which means like diving into what information is important. Uh, we'll talk about how to build your expertise based on that market, what tools and resources to utilize, and then we'll recap an AHA together, which does anybody know what AHA stands for? Or does did anybody know that it's an acronym? No. I didn't either for the longest time. And somebody recent told me, recently told me this, it stands for agents helping agents. So when we talk about ahas, part of it is to solidify the, the key takeaways that you had like individually, but it's also so other people can hear something they may not have heard or in a different way. So if you're sharing ahas, it's yes, to let the facilitator know that like, here's the solid points that I got out of it, but it's to help each other as well to understand what, what you got away from it and, and maybe in a different way and hear it differently so that they have an aha as well. So I thought that was a, a unique way to think about an aha. So I wanted to share it with you guys. And then we'll talk about daily habits and we'll talk a little bit about uh, technology and social media as well. So Let's start with this. Here's the truth. If it has been done in another market, it can be done in your market. Once it has been done, no matter where, it's just a matter of finding out how that can be possible in your world. And that's a quote from Gary Keller in the Millionaire Real Estate Agent book. Um, and, and what I love about this is you'll hear all the time, oh, my market's different. Or, oh, that's because they're in Florida, or that's because they're in Texas, or that wouldn't work here. Things are different here. And, and truly, if it's been done in one place, we just got to figure out how to do it here. It can be done. Uh, the first step to achieving the impossible in your market begins with connecting and understanding it. 
So in order to figure out how we can do it, we've got to understand what the market looks like today. So, oops, I went backwards. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's talk about knowing your market. Knowing and connecting your market is all about research and preparation. And this is something that uh, real estate agents, as you are in the industry um, for an extended period of time, this gets easier. Looking for data, knowing the data, finding the data, keeping up with the data, um, and it's not to say you need to be data experts, but there are specific numbers we'll talk about that are are good to know. And there's different levels to that. So generally speaking, there's two levels or two market factors. There's a, a macro level and there's a micro level. Does anybody know what a macro level would be as in terms of factor? Yes. Santosh. Um, something that affects the entire nation, for instance, the inflation rate. Yeah, exactly. Macro means like big level, like 30,000 foot view. So a national level statistic like inflation rates would be a, a macro level. Some people may even consider um, a city or a metro area you live in, like that could be a macro level. So then in um, on the other side of the spectrum, what's a micro level? Does anybody want to take a stab at it? What would be micro? It would be some, it would be smaller. Yeah, Logan, exactly. Yeah. Macro, if macro is big, micro would be small. So yeah. a neighborhood or a specific part of a city um, would be considered a micro level factor. So when you're talking about knowing your market, it's important to know both what's going on specifically in that neighborhood, but also what's going on in that city, that state, or nationally that might affect your client, your buyer or seller. So what would be something, and I know that everybody's in a, a little bit of a different market across the state of Oregon, but what do you know about your macro or micro market currently? What would be some statistic or factor? And there's a ton of them, so there's no wrong answers. <laughs> Santosh, you had a great one. Interest rates, inflation. I think you said inflation. That's it. Those would be factors at a macro level. What would be a micro level? Does anyone need to want to? I mean, something that I've seen is like school districts, how well they're yeah. performing. Yep, that is a very, that's a micro, a school district and um, and what's happening, whether it's in the district or opening a new school, like those types of things affect a micro market. A new business opening up in a neighborhood is going to affect the micro market. That's really good. Thank you, Santosh, for, for saying that. So it says, to be the real estate expert, you must understand your market of the moment. You see, markets change constantly and sometimes rapidly, and it requires you to pay attention, read the signs, and truly understand your market. This is the only way for you to be the expert and to be the fiduciary. This is the only way that you can deliver expertise and perspective on the market that you are, you and your clients are in. So let's dive into that and talk about know your market. There's there's three types of markets. And if you guys, does anybody download this or look at this, your student manual? No? Okay. Well, in your, okay, Carrie, you do. It, if you have your student manual, it's page 3.3. .3, it breaks down the, the three types of markets. Um, so we're just going to go through them. Whether you have the, the manual or not is not really important. <laughs> We'll talk through it anyways. Um, but if you're taking notes, it's on page 3.3. .3. So what determines a type of market? What do you think? In real estate, what would determine the market? The amount of houses. Inventory. <laughs> yeah, both both of you guys are right. The, um, the inventory, the amount of houses will determine if it's a buyer's market, a balanced market, or a seller's market. So what does a buyer's market mean? And I know it says on here more than seven months of inventory, but what, how would you describe a buyer's market? They have 
I why does seven months it, oh go ahead chris i would describe it as it's it's more buyer friendly because there's more stuff available so buyers are going to have a better choice and they're not just they they can't just they can uh do whatever they want they're not sitting around for sellers to say okay yeah we we like what you're offering etc yeah, exactly, Chris. You're you're exactly right. The buyer has the upper hand. There's more homes on the market than there are people looking to to buy. So the buyer has the ability to say um whether like they have more abilities in the in the um what's the word I'm looking for? In the negotiations. So um, a buyer's market is more than seven months of inventory. What uh, Ignite says is in a buyer's market, houses are not selling extremely rapidly. A buyer's market means there are more homes for sale on the market than there is interested buyers. Supply of houses is greater than demand. There is a large inventory of houses available. This puts the buyer at an advantage and can possibly get a great home for an affordable price. That's a buyer's market. So then what, um, on the other end of the spectrum, how would you describe a seller's market? Who wants to take a stab at that one? Um, I would just say low supply and high demand. So when they list, they're going to have a lot of buyers trying to come for their listing. Um, just because yeah, there's Jordan things on the market. Exactly right. That means that there's less homes available than there is so less supply than there is demand, which means that the seller has the upper hand and has more negotiation power because they've got a rare commodity. <laughs> um, what Ignite says is in a seller's market, demand for homes is greater than the supply for homes available, or there are more interested buyers than there are homes for saleable. This puts the seller at an advantage and often creates multiple offers. And that usually happens when there's less than five months of inventory. So if more than seven months of inventory is a buyer's market and less than five months of inventory is um, a seller's market, a balanced market is kind of around that six months of inventory. Who wants to take a stab at what, what a balanced market means? Is that a tricky one? Okay, I'll give you guys the answer. Um, in a balanced market, you have a healthy uh, amount of buyers and you have a healthy amount of sellers. So you have the supply meets the demand or the demand meets the supply. A uh, balanced market is generally represented by having six months of inventory. It means there is plenty of both houses and buyers at the same time. I will tell you that in the history of supply and demand, you're on a pendulum most of the time, right? Like there's not a very lengthy period of time where you're in a balanced market. You hit balance while you're on your way to a buyer's market or on your way to a seller's market. So um, it, as that pendulum swings, you may hit a period of time where it feels balanced, um, but most of the time it's it's swinging from a buyer's to a seller's or, or shifting from a buyer's to a seller's. So what... Um, well, I guess I gave you guys the answer to my next question. I was going to say, what is a shift in a market? And a shift occurs when we are moving from one market to the next. Uh, what kinds of things would you think would would cause a shift from a buyer's market to a seller's market or sellers to a buyer's? What factors would cause that? Interest rate. Yeah, Bo. Yep. Interest rates. That's a huge one. It's one we experience right now, right? interest rates are, are causing a specific market. What else? What are some other factors? Well, I would think inventory is definitely a, a factor because the more inventory you have or less inventory you have, it's going to cause things to shift one way or another along with the interest rates and any other outside factors. Yeah. 
Yep. Inventory is the result of a market factor, right? Like we see inventory increase when interest rates go up because there's not as many buyers available. So homes sit on the market longer. So the, the inventory increases. Um, some other things, inflation, um, mostly economic factors are what are going to shift a market on a, on a grand scale or on a macro scale. On a micro scale, you may see things like, um, and this happens in big metro areas, like a technology company comes to town. And so in that micro market, um, it may shift from a seller's market or from a buyer's market to a seller's market because there's an influx of jobs or an influx of people moving to the area. So just depending on um, where you are and if we're talking micro or macro, it could affect what type of market you're in. However, across the board, um, we does anybody know what kind of market we're currently in? Before I give you the answer. A seller's market. We are in a seller's market. We have less than five months of inventory. Thank you, Logan. Great, great job. Um, okay. Why does it not want to click to the next one ever? Um, so let's dive into the next factor, which um, types of in or so types of markets is the first thing in knowing your market. The second thing is knowing inventory. And this is where we get to talk a little bit about data. So as mentioned, inventory is the primary factor in determining what kind of market you're in. What tool would you use to determine inventory or to find out that data? How many months of inventory do we have? What tool do you use? The TMO reports. TMOs is a great one. Yep. Where does TMO, thank you, Haley. Um, and this is a question for everybody. Where does TMO, do you know where they get that data? The MLSs. The MLSs. So if we wanted to go straight to the source, the MLS is where you would determine inventory. And is everybody here using the RMLS? Yeah, for the most part, RMLS. Um, good. If you are using the WVMLS, we'll find an answer for this. I just don't know off the top of my head. But the RMLS, and I have one here provides every month what's called a market action report. And this is kind of your cheat sheet to what um, inventory looks like. There's, I think it's on the first page. Yes, on the first page, and I know I'm really small in the corner of your screens, but there's this little box that they give you that shows how many months of inventory we currently have. So if you needed just a quick glance to say, are we in a buyer's market or are we in a seller's market? That that small little graph will tell you what the answer to that question is. So applying that to real life scenarios, when would you need to know what type of market it is? When would that information be useful? To provide for your client? Yeah, exactly, Bo. Um, I promise you there's no trick questions in when I in this presentation, by the way. Um, there may just be easy answers. So when talking with a client, if you're talking with a, a buyer, they may want to know like what the process is going to be like. So knowing, okay, well, there's low inventory means that there may be multiple offers. So we may need to uh, negotiate a little bit stronger or come in with a better offer. And when you're talking to sellers, if it's a buyer's market, you may need to talk about pricing for the market you're in. You may need to talk about um, concessions. You may need to talk about things that come up in the transaction. So knowing inventory will give you um, a quick grasp of what type of uh, conversation or or expectations conversation you need to be having with your clients. Now, if you're following along in the student manual, we're on page 3.5 and it asks you these questions in the manual. What is the inventory in your market? What is the average number of days a home stays on the market? What is the average price of a home in your market sell for? Does anybody have the answers or know the answers at this point uh, for your market? 
What is inventory in your market currently? Anyone know? Looks like everybody needs to log into the RMLS and get their market action report. Um, it gives you all of that data. This is a really old one. It's from June of 2023. So I would I could tell you what the numbers were from, from June, but we're literally a year behind if we went over this data. So it's not as uh, helpful today. You know, I don't know. I just got into RMLS on Friday night. So I don't know where any of this stuff is located yet. Is it? Does it come in an email or do you go on there and search somewhere for that? Great question, Carrie. So yes, it will be emailed to you every month when the new reports come out. And this is wherever you are. Um, they create a report based on every metro area. So um, you will get an email that says the market action reports are out. Um, but you can also go into the report section in the MLS and pull up the, the archives and it'll have all of the data there as well. Okay, thank you. Uh, you're welcome. So um, that is a report that I highly encourage you guys to check out. And again, like it's just going to give you a quick glance um, instead of having to dig for the data yourself, like what is inventory, it'll give you the median home price, it'll give you the average home price, it'll give you days on market, it'll give you a ton of data um, so that you don't have to go very far to find it. Oops. Okay, the next factor is interest rates and lender regulations. So this is another important factor to know in your market because these are questions that are commonly asked by clients. So you knowing what type of market we're in, what inventory looks like, interest rates and lender regulations helps you to show up as the expert. Um, so it says interest rates and lender regulations play important roles in the status of your market. As interest rates rise, buyer power starts to dip because affordability decreases. This is something we're experiencing right now, right? Like if, if you've paid attention to the news, interest rates is a, a topic of, of conversation anytime we talk about real estate because there's speculation that interest rates are going to rise or speculation that interest rates are going to dip. Um, and that's all because it affects affordability. These rising interest rates will take some buyers out of the market. Another important number to know for your market is the average down payment percentage for home buyers in the area. Average down payment percentage for home buyers. And I will say, I do not expect you guys to be mining experts, like trying to extract raw data for the, this information. I want to give you the, the cheat codes as well. So every week uh, you should be getting an email with, from Envoy Mortgage, who is our mortgage partner in um, all four of our Keller Williams brokerages. And they give you that data at the bottom of their Monday email. So you know interest rates. They have an app that we'll talk about that can help you calculate down payments and monthly payments. So knowing your market is, yes, about having the data, but also just knowing how to, like, where to go to find the, the easy button for it so that you don't have to spend all of your time mining it um, from the news or from from a complicated source. Um, the book says, uh, do pay attention to lender regulations that can help agents get a feel for where the market is headed. If lenders are changing their policies, they could be signaling that a market shift is on the way or already here. So if you see um, new regulations coming out from your lender partners, or if you see um, new um tools or new features coming out from lenders, it may be a sign that something is coming. So just pay attention to, to what different things lenders are offering. And it says lenders may, react, may be reacting to other economic factors that agents aren't in tune with. So it's important to keep a close eye on these regulations for any changes. I would say just have a strong lender partner that can 
clue you in on these things. So having, um, whether it's Envoy or someone else that you are close with and do business with and stay in communication, maybe you set up a time once a month or, or once a quarter to, to just chat about what they're seeing in the business so that you can stay knowledgeable on, on all aspects of real estate. Does anybody know current interest rates? 7%. Yeah. Yeah. Good job, Bo. Okay. Let's keep going. Okay. The next factor, another important factor is economic factors. <clears throat> How many times can I say the word factor? Okay. So economic factors are the best way to stay ahead of potential market shifts. So when we started this conversation, we started with talking about inventory. And inventory is what I would call a lag measure. Inventory is the reaction to what's happening in our economy. So what I would call an economic factor is a lead measure. It's what changes inventory. It's what changes interest rates. It's what changes um, other factors in our industry. So this is where if you're paying attention to the news or, or what's going on in our economy, you're going to be ahead of whatever changes show up in our business. Uh, it says look for patterns over time. One of the, the factors to look at, and it says it on here, what is the employment or unemployment rate in your market? So what would a change in unemployment mean for housing? What are your thoughts? If the unemployment rate is lower, it's gonna, uh, there should be an increase in people looking to buy houses. Yeah, if we have a low unemployment rate, that means that more people have jobs, which means that there's more money to buy houses. So low unemployment is really good for our industry. And on, on the other side of that, if there's rising unemployment, people are losing their jobs. This is why when you think back to like when COVID hit and real estate came to a screeching halt because people were concerned about their employment um, and, and in industries changed. When, when unemployment is rising, our industry usually sees a decrease because less people can afford homes. So um, I love the point on here and I said it earlier, your job is not to become a research scientist. It is to understand how certain economic indicators could impact the housing market going forward. And this is all to help you in conversations with buyers and sellers. When they ask you, is now a good time to buy? Or is now a good time to sell? Well, the answer is always yes. Depends on, on who you are. If it's a better time to sell or a worse time to buy. But um, this will all help you in answering those questions. Okay. And the last one is know your neighborhood market data. As you begin previewing homes in certain neighborhoods and having open houses, it's good practice to become familiar with certain statistics of the different neighborhoods in your market. And for many reasons, this is true. But um, we started talking about this earlier. What, uh, what market factors can you think would affect a, a neighborhood? Somewhere on the screen, nearby shops and restaurants, opening and closing, right? That tells you something about that market. Proximity to facilities. I was telling someone the other day, I, I lived in Austin, Texas, and obviously now I live in Oregon. I live in Portland, Oregon. Um, being near a major airport is something that is important to me. So being near facilities is something that will cause people to either be drawn in or out in neighborhood attractions. What other things would it affect the economy of the market on a micro level? Like a highway, 
a row. Yeah. Bo, that's a really good one. If there's construction or new roads being built or accessibility to a, a local or to that area is going to either allow people to come in or cause people to move out of an area. Yep, that's a really good one. What else? Nearby so, schools. Jordan, yep. I was just going to say, someone said earlier, schools is a huge one. People will move based on schools, whether it's um, for elementary or high school or even colleges will cause people to come in and out. Also new housing developments will cause um, people to come in, right? There's more houses available in that market. So those are all things that as you're choosing your farm area may be important to know is it a neighborhood with a lot of growth? Meaning, is there new businesses? Is it close to facilities? Are there new roads or um, accessibility? Is there are there schools? Are there good schools? Um, and then the the opposite is true as well. Is there not a lot of turnover in that neighborhood? Is it a neighborhood that doesn't see a lot of growth? It's it's established, um, but maybe isn't seeing a boom. There may it, it may be a great market, but it's not going to have a lot of turnover. So something to think about as you're um, having conversations with sellers, like is it going to take them 30 days to sell or is it going to take them 120 days to sell based on the type of market they're in? And is it a desirable neighborhood? Um, same with buyers. Is there going to be a lot of inventory in the market that they want to move into because um, there is a lot of turnover. There isn't a lot of turnover. So a lot of things to know when it comes to knowing your market. Um, but again, like I said, as the longer you're in the business and having these conversations, the easier they come. Um, you'll get these reports sent to you via email through partners like lenders, through paying attention. Um, we do once a month a state of the industry address where we talk about what's going on in the economy and just knowing your local market. Okay. Again, this thing will not click to the next ever. Um, okay, ahas, agents helping agents. What, what was something you heard uh, in that first section that was an aha for you or something you wanna learn more about or have questions on? I thought the average down payment percentage was a very unique factor to understand kind of the house housing metric. Does it often veer higher for um, people that typically have higher paying jobs? Is that like a trend that's typically seen? Um, great question. And I think that the down payment percentage is based on, well, where it affects people is if they're a first time home buyer, usually, and again, this is where you'd want to talk to a lender because there's different programs depending on the, the type of buyer, but that's going to affect their buying power. Like if they, they can put down only 3%, then they're able to afford more house. But if they have to put down 20%, then they cannot, they can't they can afford as much house. So it's more that it affects the client than the neighborhood, but it's a, it's a factor in where they can purchase based on how much they can put down. So that was a really good one. Thank you for sharing that, Santosh. Any other ahas? Did you also mention that um, um, down payment um, affects like um the inventory affects the down the average amount of down payment, right? The amount inventory of affects the average amount of down payment. It could um because if there's low inventory, then buyers negotiating um may have to or has to be stronger. So they may need to have um more buying power in order to negotiate over multiple offers. Okay. Um. So I actually got this um the this month an inventory um from Shannon that I shot over the other day. Yeah. And um the number is actually two point four in April. So, and last month last month is um two point three, um and 
like how can you get from knowing that number like can you explain more a little more yeah uh is your question like what to do with that information yeah like in order to like explain to the clients yeah so i think there's a couple of things there that's important one the this the sheer number so 2.4 months of inventory means that if um, no other houses came on the market that we would be out of inventory in 2.4 months there'd be no more houses available uh so that's that's very little inventory. A balanced market we talked about is six months. So if you're talking to a potential buyer, then that means that they're going to, they're probably going to have to put multiple offers in on multiple homes and they're going to be negotiating a lot more in order to get the home that they want. Um, from a seller's perspective, if you're having a conversation with a seller, knowing there's low inventory means that they have a little bit of an upper hand to say, that um they they can they can negotiate a little bit stronger to get more money for their home. The other thing to know in that, so that's just with the raw data, with the 2.4, if that's all we knew. The fact that you knew that the month prior was 2.4 or 2.3 months says that, oh, so we're seeing more inventory, like the the number is increasing, which means that potentially the market is changing. Granted, 2.4 to 6 is is a large gap. So we've got a, a long ways to go before we are in a buyer's market. But that's a great conversation to see, to say, you know, we're seeing an increase in inventory. So either homes are sitting on the market longer um, or we're seeing a shift in the market, which on both sides could be good or bad, right? For, for a buyer, that means they have more choice, which is good. From a from a seller's perspective, now is a good time to sell before we have more inventory and competition is even stiffer. So just depending on who you're talking to, the conversation is going to look a little bit different. But yes, having the the number itself is great, and having the previous month is even better because it just adds to the story. Any other ahas? How did they? How did they come up with the number? Is it? off the listing agreements and when they're set to expire, how do they know how long, how many months of inventory they have? It, great question, Carrie. It's based on how many homes are active in the MLS. So they use that number to say, okay, based on market trends, and we know that the average home takes well, on here, you, they take days on market and say, based on the amount of days on market, so from active to sold would be our days on market and how many homes are available. If nothing else became available, what, how quickly would we sell out of our current inventory? That's how they determine our um, month supply. Thanks. You're welcome. Any other? Okay, let's move on. We're going to talk now about building your expertise. So we talked about data, where to find it, what what data is important and now what do we do with that information um let me get on the right side building our expertise okay so knowing the numbers is just the first step understanding interpreting and applying the numbers of your market to your lead generation and lead follow-up conversations are equally as important so there's four steps to building your expertise. One is learning the market. So we talked about what is the market. Let's look at the four steps to building your expertise. Um, so this, this is where we dive into like what to do with the data. So on top of having the raw data, knowing the trends is important. So we're going to talk about a couple of different things, but the first one is the language of real estate. We call it the lore report for short. And the lore report gives you listings taken, listings taken volume. Oh, I got to stop doing that. Does anybody see that thumbs up that happens? Does that happen to anybody else? They give a thumbs up and it pops up on their screen. Oh, am I the only one? I like that you guys are trying it. Thank you. <laughs> Appreciate that. Um, I will try not to talk with my hands. So we call the language of real estate the lore report, and that tracks your listings taken as a percentage, your listing taken volume, contracts written, contracts written volume, 
contracts close, contracts close volume. And what we're comparing is year over year and month over month, which means, and this is a report we provide for you. Again, you don't have to go search for the data. We're going to give this to you, but it's talking about how the market is moving. So if we think about listings taken, for example, if we say, what is the percentage increase or decrease over last month? Will tell us, okay, are we taking more listings? That's awesome. That means the market's picking up. Or are we taking less listings? The market is slowing down. And are we taking more or less listings over last year? So markets are cyclical. So we can we can tell a story based on last month and last year. I wish I had a report in front of me because this would make a lot more sense if you saw the data. But um, you're looking at listings taken, contracts written, and contracts closed are the three big numbers. Um, it's important to be focus, very focused on potential changes that seem to be more than seasonality or normal flow. Generally speaking, transactions and prices tend to be higher in the summer, while market inventory typically slows down in the winter. Market fluctuations outside of this scope can indicate changes are coming. So you'll see that, especially right now, as it starts to get nicer and it's sunnier in Oregon, our spring market picks up, which means that there's a lot more activity, a lot more homes for sale, a lot more people out looking for homes. And that also is part of like people who have uh, school age children tend to move in the summer while their kids are out of school to not disrupt their school year. So you'll see a lot more business happen, our seasonality is in the summer. And then as the year carries on through fall and winter, you'll see less activity. And I say less activity, people always need to buy and sell. So there will be activity. It'll just not be as great as in the summer months. So this is the perfect time to be doing open houses. And this is the perfect time to be lead generating and picking your farms uh, because we are ramping up for our spring and summer market. Um. As you track the bigger market, also track your own business as well. When you use command to track your leads, appointments, and transactions, you'll be able to notice trends as well. So this is when I was talking about lead measures. Uh, you can you can feel the seasonality and you can see the, the changes in the market based on what's showing up in your activities as well. For example, if you have a drop in leads coming in or a drop in the number of appointments, it could indicate some uncertainty in the market. Buyers are, are weary of interest rates or um, sellers are, are, are thinking that, I mean, they've got to buy at some point too, right? So like they're feeling insecure about the market. So if you see those fluctuations in your own activities, it could be a change in the market. Any thoughts or questions on that? Okay. So you've got, in building your expertise, learn the market. You've also got learn the clientele. And this is the fun part. Uh, as you are monitoring the numbers in your market, ask yourself who might benefit from current and future trends and who might be at risk. So based on what you guys know about our current market, who might benefit in today's market? The sellers. Yeah, Logan, exactly right. The sellers. This is a perfect time to sell your home. So knowing that it's a perfect time for sellers, what information would you be sharing with them? How quickly homes are getting sold. Yeah. Yep. Creating some urgency for them, Santosh. Yep. How quickly homes are selling. So if they wanted to sell now or they needed to move quickly, now is a good time because days on market is lower and we're going into the spring market where there's going to be a lot of buyers who are interested. I love that. So what, uh, what trends could be affecting clients right now?
we've talked a little bit or yeah we've talked a little bit about it what trends what factors might be affecting clients right now Let me say this. Um, when you notice trends in what people are, so it says, notice any trends in what people are saying to you. New objections might come into the picture while others aren't as important suddenly. Recognizing patterns is key to building your expertise. So what are people saying to you right now if you're having real estate conversations? Interest rates are too high. Yeah, that's a big one, Chris, right? That's a big trend affecting our, our market right now. And who is affected by this trend or who is at risk? Who does interest rates affect? The buyers. Well, it affects everybody, buyers. but the the sellers are at risk of their home not being sold if people don't want to buy because the the interest rates aren't where they want them to be. Yeah. I mean, that. yeah, you're right, Chris. You brought up a good point. It's affecting, and Jordan, you said the buyers first and foremost, right? Like they're the immediate effect, but also it could cause sellers to not want to sell because they may have a 3% interest rate on their current mortgage and they're going to sell that home to have a 7% interest rate. Like that doesn't always make sense for the seller. So you, that could, that's affecting our inventory. That's affecting our, um, our ability to help buyers because there's not as many homes for them to, to, to buy. It could affect the neighborhood's turnover rate. So neighborhoods aren't appreciating because homes aren't selling. So you're right. The interest rates could affect multiple, multiple people. Um, so it says the ebbs, flows, and shifts of the market can be great for different types of clients. A shift might be great for investors or those with cash looking to move into a neighborhood. So the importance to understand is that, that every factor is going to affect people differently. Things that happen are going to affect buyers differently than they affect sellers. Things are going to affect investors differently than they're going to affect first-time home buyers. So the reason I'm having you and asking you hard questions that like we have to think about is because every piece of data is is different for every different type of client. So as you think about uh information that you're gathering, asking yourself who needs to know this or who would benefit from this information is key to getting the right information to the right people. So it says, know who could benefit from the changes you're noticing in your market's numbers. Keep this in mind when it comes to lead generation and lead follow-up that we'll cover in the next section of this course. Okay, so we've talked about learn the market, learn the client. Now let's talk about listening. Listen to individuals. This is an interesting one. It says, go where your people are. Talk with the people who are learning about the market, your clients and potential clients, and chat with them. And more importantly, listen to them. The knowledge they provide could very could be very helpful for you as you make sense of the market and, as importantly, what your clients think of the market. As you make sense... As you make sense of the market, it's just as important that you listen and understand what your clients think of the market. For example, people may be saying interest rates keep going up, so I better buy now. Or my neighbor's house hasn't sold, so I'm going to hold off on selling mine because the market must not be good now. So it's important to know the market, but it's also important to hear how your clients or potential clients are interpreting the data or the information they're hearing. It's also important to understand or ask the question, where are they getting that information? Oh, where'd you hear that from? Because it may be the neighbor, right? Like the example said that uh, their house hasn't sold. It could be the news. It could be social media. So understanding where your clients are getting their information 
and asking those questions and listening because one is the the data itself, two is how they feel about it, right? Could uh, change how you approach the situation. It also may not apply, especially if it's uh, social social media or a news channel. It may be a macro conversation that they're hearing that doesn't apply to their micro situation. So just being aware of of what they're hearing, where they're getting that information, and how they feel about it is going to help you in being the expert in that situation. It says you're guiding your clients in the journey, and that means you need to know where they are and how to best help them. Any thoughts on that one? It's the one where you get off of like, know the facts, know the data, know how to interpret it. Like, let's talk about feelings for a second. (laughs) So it's always an interesting topic. And everybody feels differently. Okay. And then the fourth is keep the headlines in context. Going along with what you're just saying, as you learn your market and your clientele, be, be aware that headlines can be persuasive. So it says, where do you suspect that buyers and sellers get their information? What do you think? Most people, general population, where do they get their information? Uh, Probably friends, neighbors, other people buying and selling, the news, social media, stuff like that. Yeah. Yep. And that's all perspective, right? Like friends, neighbors, family. That's through the context of that person's perspective or or feeling on data or experience. And same with, with news stories. Like I said, headlines can be persuasive. Headlines are made to get you to click. So it's going to tell a very specific story, whether it's scary, whether it's um, the truth, whether it's macro level, micro level, um, social media, the news, local papers, friends, is all a perspective on the data, just like yours is a perspective on the data. So once you figure out where your clients get the information, read what they read and see if you can help them expand their understanding. Always pay attention to your local MLS to stay on top of what's happening in your market. And what I'd say is what's really happening in your market. Your clients rely on you to put the market in context for them. This is where you get to be the the economist of choice. You take the information and you conceptualize it for someone, which means we've got to know it first. Okay. What are your ahas based on that? Being the expert or building your expertise. I just liked your example of, of, I guess, the dialogue part makes me think I would like to practice dialoguing it. at any rate about like where did you hear that or because sometimes it's hard when you when like if someone has information that isn't really necessarily the facts and then you're trying to educate them but without like stepping on their beliefs or like how to do it (laughs) without (laughs) offending them I guess yeah Carrie thank you for saying that that's a good point oh could you send me that article I'd love to read it too like there's so much information out there. Like I'd love to know where you're getting where you're getting that from. Would you send it to me? Or where'd you hear that? Or who told you that? That's a that's a good point. The more you can ask questions, the better. I can't remember the the quote, but it's something like the person who asks the most questions owns the conversation. Or Something along those lines. So the more questions you can ask, 
the better prepared you will be in the conversation, but also like you can drive the conversation in the way you want it to go. Any other ahas? Questions, thoughts, information for the group? Who do you think have the most benefits from the market um, with the interest rates so high? Um, since you mentioned that we should ask the question like who benefits from this situation and who's not. Um, and it's clearly like everyone seems like they don't want to buy. There's no transaction, but but I can't think of any good example. <laughs> so what do you think yeah. like right now? Who's the one that has the most benefits from the interest rate? That's a great question, Bo. I think it's the person who's not affected by the interest rate. And the easy answer there is cash buyers. So investors or cash buyers are going to be the ones not affected by interest rates right now. Um, and then you're always going to have people who have to buy and sell. So people who have equity in their homes, that's another great person to or great example of a client is someone who has the equity, they're going to sell and make money to put towards their next home, um, is someone who's not as much affected by interest rates. Um, and then you've always got people who, they call them the six Ds. Um, it's in the book Shift, and it's death, dependent, divorce, deployment. Does anybody remember the other two? No. Okay. That's okay. I can't remember off the top of my head, but people who like, there's a death in the family. Oh, there's my thumb again. I gotta start doing that. There's a death in the family. There's, um, a, a move. So deployment, meaning either like there's a, a move across country for a job or, or some type of move happening, death, deployment, divorce is another one. Dependent, meaning either their family is growing because someone's having children or their children are leaving the home. Um, now I've lost track of how many Ds I've said. But anyways, there there's reasons people have to be buying and selling right now. So those are the people that I would be looking for is either they're not affected by interest rates or they have to buy and sell right now because of life circumstances. That was a great sure. question. Can I ask a question before we move on? Yeah. About the interest rates. Yeah. When I was in the schooling, they had said that it's actually kind of middle of the road. And I remember when I was young, my parents, it was like 11% normal for a mortgage. So for, I guess I might come, like depending on the age of the person, I guess new buyers might think, oh, it was so much lower. <laughs> a couple of years ago, but like in the, in the big bell curve of things, I think, aren't they pretty average right now? You guys have the best questions. I love this, Carrie. Thank you for saying that. And it's perspective, right? Yes. Historically, interest rates are still low. When I, well, I say when I got into the business, when I got in the business, interest rates were less than, less than 3%. So historically low, However, when I, like my dad's a real estate agent or was a real estate agent, my grandpa was a real estate agent. When they were in the business, interest rates were like 18, 20%. So historically, we are still at, a, at a, a, a really good interest rate. And yet people can only think about the last five years. So when you're bringing perspective to the conversation, that's a great point to say, well, historically, we're still having great interest rates. And where people forget is, and this is just getting into more data, but um, the average age of the home buyer never experienced a different market. So those first time home buyers, or uh, for me personally, this is my fourth home. I've never bought in a market that had a 7% interest rate. I've only seen less than five. 
So my lifespan of being a real estate investor or owning real estate has only ever seen that. So that's your like that's a great point. The job of the real estate agent is to know the data and the trends and to bring that perspective to say, yes, you've seen great, great interest rates. However, historically, this is way better than it, it's been. Like on an average trend line, we're still below the average trend line. Love that. Any other questions? I'll say just to counter that, though, even though the interest rates are lower, the prices of houses on average are a lot higher than they were 20 yep. years ago. Um, so that's just kind of the other side to it, I feel like. Yeah, you're right, Jordan. And that's why now is the best time to buy because there is no sign that homes will depreciate. We are still on a seller's market. We are still have, uh, have what's the word for it? Uh, our inventory is still behind what it needs to be for the amount of people that need housing. So um, it's it's not going, if, if you're buying real estate to live in or to hold, there's no sign that it'll depreciate. It'll only appreciate. So homes are getting more and more expensive. So now is the right time to buy. Great, great point, Jordan. Okay, let's keep going. So let's talk about utilizing your resources. You know how to build your expertise and your knowledge of the market. Now let's explore some tools you can be using to help you. So has everybody downloaded the KW app? Yes, no, maybe so. Awesome. Does everybody know there's two KW apps? Awesome. Okay. So if you haven't already, download two apps. One is KW Command, which is your app. It's the one you use to track your business. Um, it looks like this in the app store. It's red. The other one is the KW app, which is your client's app. It's the one that they will use in order to search for homes, save searches, um, get your information. There's a mortgage calculator on there so they can look up monthly payments. Um, they can contact you. They can pull up data about insurance and, and buying and, and, and also selling homes. So the KW app is the one you want to give your clients. Command is the one that you want to use. Uh, what are some other ways you're utilizing apps or what are some other apps you guys might be using to help you in your business? Is anybody using anything? I use Tycor Title Express. Yeah, that's a really good one. What do you use it for, Chris? I use it to uh, share stuff on social media and just see what uh, interest rates and stuff are doing as far as uh, the title companies tracking and, you know, seeing trying to learn stuff that I could share with people I talk to. That title companies have access to a lot of data when it comes to home trends, home, home owner information. So if you're ever looking for like a farm area that you want to start building your reputation in, you can use a uh, title to pull up lists of like emails and addresses and phone numbers and things like that. Um, they provide a ton of great data. So love title. Um, the Envoy app is a good one for mortgage information, um, or I'm sure there's other ones, but that's the one that we use most often, Envoy. Uh, what are some other ones? The MLS app is a good one. I was asking the guy that I shadowed and he said he uses a like mileage IQ or something and it just tracks him and then he swipes one direction for if it was work related and the other direction if it was personal so that it keeps track of his miles. 
That's a good one, Carrie. I uh, I always forget about that. For tax purposes, you get to, as you own your own business, write a lot off a lot of your miles. So having a way to track your mileage is a great tool that your CPA will um, thank you for when it comes to tax season. So mileage IQ, I know there's a couple out there, but that's a really good one. Also, I think there's one called mortgage ticker or mortgage timer, something like that, um, that tracks interest rates and data around um, mortgages and interest rates. So having that and to just pull up and be able to give information on is, is a good one. The KW app is cool too, because um, it works across the entire US. So if you are um, out looking at homes and you are with friends or potential clients, you can pull up the app and it'll give you all the information about the home, um, whether you're in your market or any market. So you look like the expert no matter where you are. Anyone else got good advice on apps? I wrote down the tech work title one. That was a good, thank you, Chris. Um, is everybody using command? Good. I think you probably have to use it through Ignite. <laughs> it's part of the program. And um, this is more about the KW app. Okay. I want to talk about this real quick. This is part of the, um, the lesson in establish your business on social media. So uh, your daily success system includes an activity to complete the 10 5, 1 social media engagement plan. Have you guys talked about this yet? Yes, no, maybe. I, um, okay. I don't know if we've talked about it in here, but I've seen this before uh, since in the time that I got started. Yeah, thank you for saying that. So um, this is a one of the ways you show your knowledge and your expertise is by sharing that information, whether it be in email or on social media or in person. So we're going to talk about the social media aspect of it. And this is a cool way to be thinking about and incorporating your business into your social media. Um, the, and, and you'll go in depth. This will be covered more thoroughly in a later date um, or a later day of Ignite. And yet this is something to begin practicing in your systems now. Uh, it says tell, or social media is a great way to market yourself freely. That's important, freely. Um, and you should be active on many, if not all of the popular social networks. Granted, there's a lot of them. So the book tells you many, if all, I'm gonna say like, if you can do one or two well, awesome. It's better than doing none of them or doing all of them mediocre. So that's just my personal opinion about that. Um, but the tip is when you post on social media, you should follow an 80-20 posting plan. 80% of your posts should not be about real estate. They should be about other interests you have. People want to work with people they like. And if you have something in common, that's already going to connect you and they're going to trust you in other aspects as well. So only one out of every five original posts you create should be about real estate. And it talks about this if you're following along in your student manual or your participation guide on page 3.8. It says, look for the activity labeled brainstorming your social media personality. Um, open your social media. I know in classes they usually tell you to stay off social media, but... For this exercise, open your social media and look at some of your recent posts, things you've liked, or if you're like on TikTok or Instagram, like your for you page or the things you're interested in page um, and see what's on there that's not about real estate. This might include if you're a parent, like kid things about kids, um, it might involve involve travel or music or motivational content. These interests are key to establish your brand and presence on the internet, what you want to be associated with. 
So take a minute and write down the top three things you like or you find the algorithm has given you based on your interactions that I'm curious what they are. I'll do it with you guys. Does everybody have theirs? Does anybody want to share? I'll go first. I'm a mom. So I have a lot of things about kids on mine. I have a lot of things about country music on mine. I think because it's like festival season or something. Not that I even go to festivals. But anyways, kids, country music, and a lot about like style and design. So that would be my social personality. If I were to go and post, I would write do something about kids, something about style and design, or something about music four times for every five posts. And one about real estate. What about you? What do you what's your personality? I I I'm a I'm retired army, so I'm a veteran. So I just that there's a lot of stuff that my friends post or that I would normally interact with that some people might not understand or or get. So I try not to include a lot of that stuff and focus mainly on the business and interacting with things that my friends from back home or, you know, people I went to school with and they like and try to support them and get word about their stuff in the hopes that it'll come back and help me. Yeah, Chris, that's a good point. Like if you're interested in the things that your friends are interested in, or I mean, even like if you want to work with other veterans, talking about and, and sharing that content will attract other veterans like it has attracted you. And so it'll build that niche in your business where you will be seen as someone they can relate to and will be the expert on that specific demographic. So I love that. That's awesome. What else? Who's got another example? I'll Jordan. just piggyback off of what Chris said. Um, I do think it's important to share your own interests too, and not just the interests of other people. Um, because people want to know who you are and want to be able to personalize with you and kind of know you as a person and not just a business person. Um, yeah. so I just want to throw that out there. But for mine, um, I get a lot of crochet stuff, which I am crocheting. <laughs> um, I get a lot of like animal videos and then a lot of um, videos about like TV shows or movies and stuff like that. Oh, so how could you use that information? Thank you for sharing that. I love it. And I did see you crocheting and I was like, what is she working on? It's a blanket <laughs> for my for my baby, but it's a bunch of little heart squares. Oh, how cute. I love that. Yeah. So so by sharing, oh, that is super it's cute. It's going to be really big, but it's a lot. A lot of small pieces. Yeah. Um. So by sharing about your crochet projects, that mm -hmm. could potentially attract other people who are interested in that, that you would naturally in your like normal human life be friends with. Mm -hmm. Now you get to work with people that you like and they like you because mm -hmm. you're, you have similar interests. And that's actually, that's actually what I made my first Instagram post was a crocheting post because I was like, I don't really want to just jump out of the gate and say like, hey, buy a house from me. <laughs> so I, I did make a crochet post for my first post. And yeah, I don't know. I feel like just being yourself helps you connect with other people. Also, could like I'm thinking, could you crochet something for all of like when you have clients who buy houses, like something that they idea. could they could have in their house basket and throw in a little yeah yeah, yeah. that's a good idea I'm adding that I love <laughs> that and that could be something like working like 
got another like closing working on this project for or like this crochet mm-hmm. project for my client. So you're sharing what you're doing and what you love, right. but it also ties it back to real estate. Yeah. That's that's a good idea. I'll figure out something. Some type of house design. I don't know. We'll have to work on that one. Um, <laughs> what is another, what's something else you guys, um, that's your, your social media personality. I have a lot of mom groups. And I'm in uh, several like outdoors, hiking, kayaking groups and gardening. That's my main things. I love that, Brianne. There's actually an agent um, out of the Sunset Corridor office who she loves biking or cycling, I guess. And she's created a group of cyclists that she runs the group and they go out and they cycle every Sunday. And 90% of her business comes from that group. Yeah. So like taking those interests and saying like, Hey, how can I put this group of people together? And it allows her to be the established real estate expert in those groups. So I love that. That's a really cool idea. And sharing, I mean, I'm like now on the train of like client gifts, like, could you grow something or, or deliver a plant or something for every home buyer, like something they could yeah. like flower, they could put in their yard. Yeah. That's seed packets, fun. things like that. Yeah. I've also seen, um, client, uh, parties, um, that I was invited to one where it was, and it was during COVID, but it was a, uh, horticultural horticulturist. Is that what the plant person is called? Anyways, they they did a class on like knowing what plants were good in backyards and like what were poisonous and what would grow, what wouldn't. And it was a client event for this real estate agents, all their clients. And they walked away with a plant, but also learned about like what would be good uh, in, a, in a garden or what would be detrimental to dogs or kids. So something you could add into into your business is like how to incorporate both of those. Um, Chris, I got your message and I will get you on that Envoy mailing list. If anybody else is not getting the Envoy emails, um, reach Thank out you. to me, send me an email at katiehardman at kw.com. I'll put it in the chat. Um, and I'll make sure you're on that mailing list. Oops, I sent that just to Chris. Um, so anyways, establishing your business on social media, this is again, like I said, a free way to be sharing information about the real estate industry, getting your word out there, but in a way that's natural and is going to uh, invite people that you already know and already like you into your day-to-day activities. The goal would be 10 to like 10 posts a day, write five comments a day and send one direct message a day. If this is truly in your lead generation activities, something you want to incorporate, then the 10, five, one is a great rule of thumb to, to grow that lead generation lever. Um, let's see. We talked about that. Hold on. I'm on the wrong page. Okay. The other enrichments portion of your daily success system is about knowing the numbers and gaining a strong foundation, foundational knowledge of real estate. So here are some ways that you can increase your knowledge and understanding of your market. So study the market center reports. That's that language of real estate. Um, preview homes, that's going to give you a great understanding of different types of homes, different types of neighborhoods. Take an MLS course or download your market action report. Visit and hold open houses. That's not only going to give you great information about homes and the market, but it's going to give you a great understanding of common questions that clients ask. Like, What questions are they asking you in that open house? Um, study the language of real estate, read the millionaire real estate agent book. Um, what are some other ones? What are some other enrichment activities? Is there anything you guys are doing to enrich your knowledge of the market? Uh, 
well going and looking, previewing for inventory. Yeah, that's a big one. Thank you for saying that, Carrie. That there's nothing that beats physically going to the homes. Anything else? Okay. Ahas. Anything you guys got out of that last section that was an aha for you? Or question? Okay. I like the cycling group thing. I thought that was cool, like figuring out a group and and then having people be a part of it and then it just is kind of natural. Um thank you for for that aha. She actually it's funny because it started as a cycling group that got so big and and what worked so well in her business. She also started a hiking group. So now she's getting her exercise and doing two different activities and um, creating a community where she is bringing her clients to her based on something she likes to do and let, and they like to do. And all she does is provide snacks and put the group together and decide where they're cycling or what they're hiking, hiking that week. And the business actually comes. They're also like, they sign, I think like a, they sign up. So she gets their name and email and phone number. So then she can also send them other information. Any other ahas? Okay. So we talked about, here's our recap. We talked about knowing your market and we talked about building your expertise in that market. So types of markets, types of inventory interest rates and lender factors, economic factors, other factors, <laughs> um, and then building your expertise. Like once, once you have that data, what does it tell you about that market? What are your, what does your client need to know or what types of clients need to know different types of information, listening to your client or individuals to understand what they're hearing, how they're interpreted, interpreting it, how they feel about it. And then always remembering to keep the headlines in context because the headline could be telling a different story than is actually the truth. And then using that information for good and connecting with your database base and, and potential clients based on your personal interests because that just makes it more fun. I like to work with people that have the same interest. I'm sure you like to work with people that have the same interest as well. Okay, the next section is success systems. Does anybody go into this in the have has anybody gone into success systems in the ignite sessions? Where you like role play? Okay. Well, it says for the next two hours. So I'm assuming that you guys do this at another time and that what we were supposed to talk about today was connecting with your market and that you guys are role-playing individually with your coaches or with your groups, um, which means that we're we're done 30 minutes early. Is there anything else you guys want to talk about? Anything else you have questions on or would you like the 30 minutes back in your day? <laughs> My only question was when you were talking about like giving the crochet thing in the basket, were you talking about at closing or was it like something as like you kept saying baskets and I wasn't sure. <laughs> That's a great, thank you for saying that. Um, So when we were talking, well, what I, Jordan, you'll have to tell me what you thought. What I meant is yes, like a closing gift at closing, providing a basket of different, uh, why does that keep happening? I don't know. Um, uh, yeah, it's a party. All kinds of things happen when I move my hands. So um, at closing, providing a basket of lots of people will do like wine or a cutco knife or something they made, whether it's crocheted or, or otherwise. So yes, closing basket. But you could provide something at the beginning too. Not to say it had to be at the end. Okay. That was I've what seen, I was. Yeah, I've seen people give away like koozies 
um, at the beginning, like if they're going to go out for a long day of, of looking at homes, like providing koozies for their drink, which koozies always make me think of like alcoholic beverages. So that's not what I mean, but, uh, I've seen a lot of different things being given out at different times. Great question. Anyone else have a question or want to spend this time talking about anything that's going on in your business? So since you mentioned about Instagram and um, so I've been trying to go and look at houses and like sometimes take a video and I wonder, so I will always ask the agent, like, can I post it or can I not? And some of the agent are wrong with it, but some is not. Um, so I'm just wondering what are the thoughts behind, like, they don't want you to post it. So I think sometimes that probably is a seller preference. Um, mm -hmm. And there's probably some marketing guidelines around that. What I would do is, this is my opinion. Um, when people post tours or just like new listing posts on, on Instagram or on Facebook, not really interested. Unless I was buying or selling a home at that point. Like, I don't know that... Um, that I, I'm super interested in just seeing, oh, congratulations, you got a new listing. Awesome. What I'm more interested in is the, or let me say this, what would make that interesting? Like, what about that house? Does it have a funky front door? Or does it have, and this is real life, a toilet in the closet? Or is there a frog in the pool? Like something about that house that makes it unique that you could be talking about. Like, and maybe there's an agent that their brand is like the red front door or some, something about red front doors. So like she always takes pictures of front doors and that's what makes the homes unique. So I would say what, what about what you're doing is interesting and unique and is going to cause interaction. So, and, and if you're just taking a picture of you, there's someone who takes a picture in bathtubs when she's out previewing homes or doing broker tours. So like, what about what you're doing could be interesting to other people? Cause that's what you're trying to do is capture interest. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, but yeah. Also the, the question is like, when I asked the permission from the like listing agent, sometimes they don't want, they like, not sure, like they don't want me to like post anything about the house so I I'm not sure because I'm new here so I'm like oh like what's the purpose like that they don't want you to post anything on the, about the house I I think that I mean it could be different for every person however the, some of the common reasons they may say that is there may not be permission from the seller to be posting videos um so that would be a huge one if they don't have permission also um they have the the permission to market the home. If you're with a different brokerage or if you um, don't have express permission to be marketing the home, then it just gets a little, like it's a little bit of a gray area on what you can and cannot market when it's not your listing. So they may just be cautious or, or nervous about um, exposure of their listing without permission. Okay, got it. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Any other questions or thoughts or mastermind topics you guys want to talk about? To go off of the social media, I know a lot of people use Instagram and I know you mentioned TikTok. Do you use TikTok? Because everyone I've talked to just uses Instagram. So I, I know like TikTok is newer and so a lot of people haven't really used it a whole lot for marketing. Um, but is that something that you do personally? So personally, no, okay. I do not. <laughs> um, no uh, however, I do. I've seen, uh, I've seen agents use it from an educational standpoint to just share like little snippets of like information you should know about purchasing a home or information you should know about um, selling a home. And um I think that it depends on what demographic you're you're looking at or you're you're trying to 
capture if that's where you want to spend your time. I, I've like started Instagram and I know that TikTok is also very popular, obviously. <laughs> um, and I use it for fun, but I haven't used it for business yet. So I wasn't really sure how to even start that. But yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Everyone I've talked to just uses Instagram Reels, so. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know that I'm the expert on TikTok. That is okay. I will find someone one day who is, but that's okay. I think it'll become more and more popular. I do. I really like the, um, some people do house walkthroughs too, and I like those. Mm. I like watching those for entertainment. <laughs> I use TikTok to do like walkthroughs if I'm touring a house or something like that. And then I will also post it to Instagram and Facebook Reels. So it goes all over my socials. Are you getting a lot of good interaction from those? Um, I get more interaction on like Facebook than I do anywhere. Um, okay. But it's it's decent for the most part. It's not terrible. So. Yeah. I love Something that. Better than nothing. Yeah. For well, sure. I should try Facebook. But... <laughs> I know I have a friend who's an investor. And so she'll go in and on TikTok, like walk through like nasty homes. And for some reason, I am a, I watch those ones yeah. <laughs> when they're like disgusting and need to be torn down just to see like the transformation. I love those too. There's a girl that bought an abandoned house and she is always posting what they're doing to it. And I'm so invested in it. It's just. Yeah. Yeah. So there you go. That's what you should be posting because you want people who are interested in the same things you're interested in. I just have to find some abandoned homes now. Okay, you guys, um, I appreciate you spending the last two hours with me. If you have any questions, email me, reach out to me. I am here. I am happy to help you. Um, otherwise, I wish you all luck on starting your real estate careers. And um, your next session is tomorrow. Okay. Happy Monday, you guys. Thank Bye, you, everyone. Katie. Thank you.